good morning or good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world. Thank you to EXP Realty for sponsoring today's episode. Talent Finders would like to welcome digital media and accelerating early stage startup Alison Dollar. So welcome, Alison. Hello, how are you doing? Good, thanks. And yourself? Great to be with you. So, Alison, I'd like to congratulate you on all your achievements. Can you share with us how your entrepreneurial journey started? Well, my entrepreneurial journey started not as an entrepreneur, per se. Yes. Although, in hindsight, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in my family, but really mostly academia and artists and other kinds of interesting folks like that. Yes. I have a master's degree in English literature. I was a journalist and did other things. But in the course of that, I was very fascinated with what was going on in digital media. It wasn't even called that then back in the 80s. Yes. Advanced media, we call it now. Emerging media, we called it then because it was indeed merging. So yes. in the course of covering people that were doing interesting things in nascent VR and the early, early internet, and other kinds of devices for interactivity, like CDI and LDI and those disc hardware-based things. Yeah. Uh, I got very interested in, in the business side and how those things were coming to market and what the forces meant for the media industry. Amazing. So your speciality- Well, you know, it's fun to be young and, and have opinions at the time, right? Yes. And, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, uh, it was actually very shocking to my advertising clients at the time in the magazines. I was the editorial director of a magazine called In Motion Magazine, and we had some other pretty big competitors. So I repositioned it to cover with the tagline Emerging Trends in Film and Video. Yes. And it was a very nice sweet spot. So all those new companies that were getting money from Silicon Valley finally started come to the fore against the what we would call the big box hardware legacy companies and yeah. um i was a champion for giving them a voice and that's how i became pretty well known for working on that edge and uh it was fun amazing so your speciality and your background is obviously media and your core focus was around corporate and business development. So can you share with us more about this and what makes you different from other competitors in your industry? Well, ironically enough, I think what makes me different is that I did not come from traditional business or even really traditional film and television. I did work in traditional film and television. I did some stuff for CBS, for the Maryland Film Office. I worked with the National Association of Broadcasters and all that stuff. But I think having that arts background and having kind of a multicultural, if you will, for want of a better term, cross-section of my experience, I have a really different perspective. I also didn't ever work very long inside a big corporation. So I worked with them very closely, Fortune Corporations, but I've never worked inside for very long. I worked for Philips Business Information for a while in the 90s. Uh, that was as close as that would get, I guess. And so I've never been beholden to any corporate masters. Mm. And it really is a different thing if you are used to thinking across discipline mm. and interdisciplinary and how things are interrelated. And that's how the film and television piece is related to some of these other things that I do, for instance, in the uh, burgeoning space tourism and ghost kitchens. I have a client right now doing that. I think it is a, just a whole different perspective if you haven't taken a linear path. Yes, absolutely. So within that, what would you say some of your biggest lessons and learnings have been within your career? Well, just lately, I've been reflecting on the importance of saying no. Yes. You know, and, and maybe and that, that might be a fact of where I am in my age and my career, too, where you do have to be more selective. So perhaps it is true that earlier on, it's great to say yes to everything, to have as many experiences and to build your network and all those sort of things. But at some point, you have to be very judicious in how you manage your time, yes. and manage your attention and, and your energy. 
And it's very difficult when you love what you do and there's so many interesting, amazing things going on. It's hard not to just want to jump in everything that comes your way, but it's important not to. So yeah. I think that was, that's one major le learning. I think the other wasn't a learning, it was more a reinforcement, which is from my family, which is to always treat people as you would wish to be treated. And it sounds so rudimentary, the golden rule, but it's very, very true. And as you know, in the film and television business, that's often not the case. You ha often have people that have egos that are very fragile themselves. So then they- Oh, big they, time. That whole industry is full of that. Right? It's, it's amazing. Well, in Silicon Valley, in a way, is even worse. Yeah. And then, you know, I kind of triangulate between Madison Avenue, Silicon Valley, and in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, so the term diva is not used loosely. <laughs> no. But the NAS, all the but sheer also they don't They don't really know the true definition of a diva anyway. I mean, I think the most original diva that I could ever say was the classic diva was Maria Callas. Yeah, so yes, who's absolutely deserved yeah. to but, be but one, But all these right? modern, modern divas, they, uh, to me, it's, it's just, you know, it's just complete ego. Yeah, I think you should say uh, self-styled divas. And narcissistic. Because, right, they're self-styled divas. They're, they're not true divas. Yeah, so, well, unfortunately, in our business, narcissism is rewarded. And we've mm -hmm. seen that really, of course, dramatically get highlighted by our recent political situation here in the U.S. And mm -hmm. it is very disheartening and honestly, very tragic how all of that behavior, I think, hastened in part by social media. And I do have some guilt about that since I had fostered the social platforms in the course of my career, mm. uh, because you perforce have to be talking to yourself in a mirror all day long, mm. literally, as and when you were creating social <laughs> yeah. uh, clips. But also, so I, don't you think, Alison, to highlight on that point, that it's something that Oprah said once, and I, I don't want to reference necessarily to celebrities, but one of the things is you either get used by the platforms or you use the platforms responsibly. And people want to speak about freedom and democracy and everything else, but with those freedoms and democracies comes responsibility. And I think that that's where there's a lack of true understanding and also yeah, just utilizing the platforms responsibly rather than you know the opposite. So I well, the pro I think the problem too is the cash motivation. Oh, big time. So this is, you know, the issue. I mean, you of, see it with mainstream media now all the time. If they're pushing one narrative, but nobody's telling the other side of the story. And it's all about their bottom line because, you know, big corporations are paying these people. Yeah, but right. It's the, where the incentives lie. And that's the thing about a business to figure out how to triangulate all those incentives with where the profit centers could be or new revenue streams are. Mm. But I think it's honestly more fundamentally problematic than that, because I don't think, and this may be also generational and totally unfair, but I don't think a lot of these people, especially some of the influencers I've come across, actually know they're not making a choice. They, they don't know any other way to be. No, they don't. This, this no one taught them. Yes. And so, you know, again, I kind of, interestingly enough, in this conversation, keep circling back to kind of fundamental basic roots of liberal arts education and reading. You know, I would say if one of the watchwords I would say to anybody say, oh, well, what's the way in terms of being in tech or in terms of making your way in digital media? What's a great thing to do when you're a kid? And I still say, read a lot of books. Yeah. You know, it is wonderful to have all the skills with video and we all can even edit and do some terrific things, but you have to have some foundation of ideas and knowledge and frankly, character, because yeah. there's only so far it go takes you when it's uh, completely shallow. And we know there's a little reaction against that stuff, but um, I think some things have been fundamentally damaged and uh, we'll see what happens there. Yeah. So I want to touch on digital marketing, brand engagement, consumer electronics, and enterprise technology, with consumers becoming more conscious in all their purchasing. How do you help your clients 
to position themselves and translate the message authentically through these digital media platforms? Well, I think a uh, nice segue from this previous part of this conversation is that you have to be really honest and authentic with what your brand stands for mm -hmm. and what your product is and why you're even using the tool that you're using. Yeah. So if you're using Instagram versus Facebook versus some other traditional means, you really have to do real strategy and real tactics. But what I see a lot of times is everyone just jumping to the tactics per our previous part of our conversation, because they think it's all just about trying to be viral and this and that. It doesn't do any good to just be pushing things if the engagement isn't lasting. If it's ephemeral engagement, even if there's a transaction baked in and yeah, you sell and get a spike of commerce there, mm -hmm. it's not gonna help you in the long run unless you're really building some sort of loyalty. Yeah. And you can't get loyalty without community or at least without a full, mutual understanding of the value exchange of what the brand stands for and your customer. Mm -hmm. And I do think one good thing about social and these other forms of digital has been to remind everyone that it's not just the straight traditional demographics that matter. In other words, if you are a soccer fan, you're a soccer fan, regardless of your age or your race, or your education level and all the things we use traditionally measure in demographics. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the fundamental point is that you love soccer. Yeah. So brand agencies, the big agencies do have religion there. They understand it. I do think that um, a willingness to be more experimental of new things, you see that with augmented reality in particular, which is, you know, I'm a huge fan of it, mm -hmm. not necessarily just mobile, but also location-based entertainment uses things like that and pushing the envelope there and thinking of ways to do storytelling. All these things are bandied about a lot, as you know, and some of it's just lip service, but all of the brands and agencies that are thinking about doing it in a true way and genuinely committed to doing it are having some very cool breakthroughs. And then sometimes, you know, you get lucky, like the ocean spray that did go viral the guy has it in his hand the whole time. You can't plan that kind of thing, really. No, you can't. Not at all. So that leads me to the next question. Digital media is so oversaturated and being bombarded by so much coming at consumers all the time. What do you believe you do differently to set you apart in your approach when working with clients? And can you give us any examples? You mean, what do I do myself? Different. Yeah, so whether it's yourself or, you know, your own personal approach or, you know, when you're working with other people. Yeah, I think, well, for one thing, I tell it like it is for the reasons stated before in my personal history. Yeah. You know, I'm not timid. I, even when I was less experienced, I probably was a little more careful. And now I, as you can tell, I just I don't care. No. <laughs> So I, and but honesty, I is, honesty is better, I think, and just being more direct. It doesn't mean you're being insensitive. It just means that you're telling it like it is. And yeah, I mean, I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but I am very direct. And also I have this weird mix because I grew up on the East Coast, but I've spent a lot of my career on the West Coast. So yeah. I have this combination of an East Coast impatience, but I have a lot of tolerance too. You know, I'm actually quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, uh, you know, I give advice freely and quickly and, uh, and it usually works because the people are they either looking for guidance or also they're looking for somebody to help them ease the load. Yeah. So I think just also having worked in every medium, you know, print, mm -hmm. traditional mm -hmm. broadcast, multimedia, streaming. I was the chief strategy officer of webcast.com, which was one of the first ones that went public uh, back in the first bubble, for instance. So I, I cross every single media platform in radio too. Okay. I have some kind of experience. So that's another kind of unique thing. A lot of people either came up in TV and they said, oh, this is cool over here. I like this you know, streaming media stuff but they came to it only like 10 years ago versus 25. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what can you say? That's the experience does count, even though we're a youth oriented industry. Yeah, uh, absolutely. 
the perspective is real different. But I do think just fundamentally, again, you know, having this weird in terms of unusual combination of liberal arts orientation, mm-hmm. a lot of business, practical, real world experience, and then the personality is just something that's where I find the sweet spot to be really well suited for all this digital world because it moves very quickly yeah. and you have to be able to see over the horizon. And honestly, I've been too early a lot of the time. I've done a lot of things that were too early. I did a precursor to Snap. I did an early VR, lots of things where I lost money. So along with my clients, I am not risk averse. I've taken a lot of risks because I just enjoy the process yeah. So it's not, it's not for everybody and people that get in it thinking, oh, well, look, this is hot. I'm going to go and yeah, they're the, the next Facebook or the next whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and they just chase the trend. Right. Yeah. So I don't do that. I anticipate the trends and then I pick and choose based on my actual background and expertise and my interests. But I don't just hop around. No. So that leads me to the next question. You are. CEO and co-founder of Interactive TV Alliance. So can you share with us more about this and what made you want to set up this company? Well, you know, it's an interesting, uh, given that we're coming up on the anniversary of 9-11, because we were, those of us that were in this digital media space, we're already working on what next generation television would look like. And there was a trade association out of the American Marketing Association had this group called the Addressable Media Coalition. Mm -hmm. And it had traction, but it didn't really have a home. So because I and my co-founder, Ben Mendelson, were really well known in the champions in that sector and everything, everyone's like, you guys should do this yourselves, spin it off. And we thought that made sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the U.S. was dragging its heels Uh, your listeners might remember back about doing the digital transition. It wasn't happening here. We were way behind and it was ridiculous. And you already had in Europe, like Sky and everybody else that was looking at interactivity into the uh, set-top box and all this sort of stuff. And then, of course, it was happening online with just even the banner ad world that we knew back then that was clearly very promising. So then there was a conference on next generation television here in LA on 9-11. And I had just flown back from New York. In fact, I'd just been at the World Trade Center like two days before. And I flew back and the flight was late. And I got into LA on 9-11 around one o'clock in the morning LA time. And then the very next thing, you know, it was all went crazy. So Mm -hmm. we ended up having the conference because everyone, first of all, wanted to be together and we were all in shock and didn't know what to do and all this sort of thing. So, of course, it's like ridiculous trying to have conversations about certain interesting things that were happening. But At the same time, everyone was kind of declaiming from the microphone, like, we're not going to sit back from this. And yeah, it was very emotional time. So it galvanized us starting the organization, getting it going and formalizing it. So uh, we formalized it. And so that was the real genesis then was 9-11. And then we didn't really launch launch until a year or so later. But we had right out of the gate, all the major players in there, including Open TV and Wink and ACTV, which were rolled up by Liberty Media, like literally announced, they announced that they were, Liberty was buying them all up. Same day we announced we were launching the organization. (laughs) So that just shows you, it's like how quickly it was all going. But the point of it is, is that nobody was really minding the store and helping to galvanize that effort here in the U.S. in a formal way. It's a nonprofit trade association. There are things you can do as a nonprofit and work with other organizations and all that sort of thing. And, you know, by this point now in 2021, it's really not needed for that anymore. So I mostly use it as a programming arm to do conference tracks and things that's very targeted for other organizations, other conferences. We had retreats like the Reinventing Television Summit, um, the Queen Mary, 
and a lot of fun and really interesting, very dynamic things because it was interdisciplinary. And we were the first one to be interdisciplinary in terms of our membership in the media business. Yeah. So most of them are verticals, right? National Association Broadcasters, National Cable Television Association, across a very vertical. We went across. So yeah. we had Kraft Foods and Microsoft and Comcast, right? And Intel across. Everybody was in the room. It was a very exciting time. Uh, we got a lot done and served that purpose. But that's kind of how it happened where we were already committed to helping and then we just formalized it into a structure. And then it's persisted to this day, just in altered forms as the phases come through. Mm. That's fascinating. So within that, what would you say some of your biggest career highlights have been? Yeah, you know, there's this, probably been many, but what <laughs> well, at this point in my life, you reflect on it. It's like, I don't know, because uh, I guess chairing the executive committee for the National Association of Broadcasters, what they called multimedia world, because that led to a whole bunch of other things, uh, including them in part building the South Hall in Las Vegas to hold the, what was called multimedia at the time. So that was wonderful. And um, the ETV World Conference I did in the mid 90s, which it's hilarious. Everyone's kind of forgotten and it was big. I mean, we had, you know, 600 people and all that, but it was, uh, it made it all real. Like, yeah, this stuff's really going to happen. It's going to be a real business. And mm. certainly as an industry segment, it backslid some because people got distracted by mobile and didn't realize at first that, yeah, there's going to be mobile video people. And then it all, of course, has integrated together. As starting ITA, yes. Also, um, taking webcast.com public as I being broadcast, yes. That kind of stuff's been, I guess, highlighted. Mm. But it's such a continuum. I don't even know. I mean, I would say my book, but the thing is, they priced it so high. We didn't sell a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote the book on the stuff in 2003. It was published and it was so relevant even now. Mm. And I think for me, that was a like personal thing just to get it out of my head. So, you know, there's different ways to measure this stuff. But yeah. overall, it really has been more the experience of it, living in the history, knowing we were all making history, being friends and connected with other executives and peers literally for 30 years now. I mean, that kind of blows my mind when I think about it. I mean, literally some of these people I met back in like 1988, and we've all stayed in it because we knew just in terms of the historical importance that it was going to change the world in many ways. And it has. Yeah, that's amazing. So you've obviously had a very diverse uh, career in the media industry, as well as being involved in many startups, having gone through this process multiple times. Do you believe that this has helped you to get to where you are today? And do you believe that this has given you an advantage within the digital and media space? You mean the diversity of my background? Yes. Yeah, you know, that's a mixed bag. But <laughs> because some people who don't know, and honestly, they're mostly men, can be very dismissive. Oh, very. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I will come on the scene and I will speak with authority and they want to shoo-shoo me off. Mm. And, you know, I'm not having it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I know I know what I know and I know what they don't know and yeah. because as I said previously a lot of them have very traditional backgrounds they got a business BA then they get their MBA then they work in the one company then they work in the other company and they don't understand building coalitions outside of their sector yeah. or being open to what other kinds of organizations are doing. I think the fact that I've worked with all these nonprofits also in these big trade associations is a really different thing than people who are only going and attending as some kind of corporate mandate. That's not the same as being the people building the infrastructure of the industry. Yeah. And then on the upside, of course, it's you just know where the bodies are buried, as they say. You know, what so-and-so used to be over there and what it means to cross from being inside a brand to going to a big agency or going from Fox to Disney to NBC Uni. I mean, somebody who like that, I'm thinking of in particular, that has that career path, their eyes get 
kind of wide because things are done very differently at those corporations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you're working with them all the time, the way that I am, you have a totally different perspective on it. So I do feel like just for my own satisfaction and comfort level, having that wide variety makes me more comfortable. And of course, you know, when you're comfortable, you can perform better mm -hmm. and you can be more directive when you need to be with your clients. Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, otherwise what happens, I think, is everyone just does emperor's no clothes and they just reinforce what they think the client wants to hear. And then they make some significant errors. Yeah, so absolutely. That doesn't happen too much on my watch. So you're also the executive producer of the Space Tourism Conference and Orbit Awards, which is very exciting. So can you share with us more about this? It's very interesting, that part. Well, to me, there's a logical intersection there again with my interdependency and intersectionality. John Spencer, who founded the Space Tourism Society, we were introduced because we were futurists. Yes. And our friends all knew we liked some of the same things about what could be done with emerging technologies. And he has some media background too, entertainment mm -hmm. stuff too. So I was on the board there and produced our other conferences honoring Dennis Tito and the early space tourists and all of that. Where it made a lot of sense was in the crossover with satellites and of course the onset of uh, streaming video and all those sorts of things because it's all about communication if you're in space and yeah. you're back in mission control. Mm -hmm. And of course the earth-based experiences from space, not the least being all the big franchise movies like Star Wars and Star Trek and all that kind of thing. It crosses over a lot. Mm -hmm. So that all made sense. It was, again, kind of a fun and interesting and very comfortable place to play. But in the course of it, now that it's truly taking off the venture capital community, I chair the Los Angeles Venture Association Media Group, for instance, and the Space Group we just launched. But when that all started happening, where the real money came in, SpaceX, X Prize before that, all this stuff that has happened with these, in turn, very large corporations, we saw that there was a need to have a conference dedicated to space tourism itself. Because there were a lot of naysayers. Of course, many of the actual astronauts were very dismissive and disparaging of space tourism. They didn't want the amateur. Well, they were like that with Elon and SpaceX as well. I mean, I, I think they just didn't like the idea of commercial flight space. Commercial you know. and privatization in yeah. general. And then the idea of a tourist. There, there's no other way it could have survived because, as you know, I mean, you know, when was the last flight that NASA did before things just came to an end? Or hope, yes. Well, and that's the thing, because then even in new space, as they're calling this chapter, you have the commercial people talking about the B2B and still don't like the term tourist. But no. tourists spend a lot of money and it, tourists have big dreams. And even the ones when the prices come down, they've always been the case in the history of aviation that's what happened there i'm watching this great show about the early days of klm and how that all transitioned from war planes to passenger commercial and private pleasure flights in the in the 20s and 30s so it's the same thing of going off world and since i was already doing some of these other things. John and I said, yeah, let's do the conference. And we did the first one in April. The next one's shaping up for next April. We hold it on the anniversary of Dennis Tito's flight because that's the true demarcation of a paying person going. And it just, again, keeps crossing over more ways than you would ever think. It's just fascinating, especially with VR and immersive experiences and training facilities and all the kinds of things that you already do with digital media that are completely germane to planning to have this thriving industry of going off world that um, there really isn't much more of a fun place to be playing, that's for sure. No, absolutely. So obviously COVID-19 turned our world inside out and upside down. How and what has this affected your business? And what have you had to do to adapt? And can you give us any examples? 
Well, first of all, all of the in-person conferences were canceled. Yeah. So the last one I went to was the Consumer Electronics Show, which I'm sure was a super spreader event, even though uh, CTA would probably be mad at me for saying so, but it just calls to reason. You got 100,000 plus people there in Vegas. And uh, I know I was with my streaming media company guys and we were all in the suite and we were all sick. Now, I'm not saying we all had COVID, but that's what happens in those conferences. Of so course. they, they were all canceled. Like yeah. Synthetic air conditioning. So of course there's going to be things. That- yeah. So the first space tourism conference, in fact, we had to just push it to the next year altogether. And then we still this year had to do it virtually anyway. So that was a huge difference for me because usually I'm always out and about at all the shows and going and hosting and moderating and, and, you know, LA doing lunch, right? It's like a big part of how we do business is we meet and greet and go to cocktails and do all that stuff. So that was very shocking and very abrupt when all that went dark. On the other hand, because of Zoom and because of digital media, it didn't really stop our business because we all just... Yeah, you just had to adapt. You had to adapt, jump on the stuff. I have a huge Zoom fatigue. Actually, it's much more pleasant for me to be talking to you now just on audio, honestly, because it's yeah. <laughs> very difficult when you're having to hold the gaze unnaturally and all that that happens. But it's great also to get the sense that you're together And other things did slow down. So I did okay. But as an independent consultant, you know, you take a hit. And I think I adapted really, really well until our restrictions here in California lifted. And then I realized how traumatized I had been. Oh, for sure. Everybody. I mean, I think there's a massive social anxiety that's come along with this situation. Yeah, it just was, uh, it just sort of hits you at an odd time because I was like, okay, I'm fine. I'm in my place. Everything's, you know, everybody's healthy and in my family and thank God. And, um, but then later I was just really upset. And also just honestly, I will say candidly, the nasty political atmosphere is really weighed me down almost more than COVID. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, if you were going to untangle the two- of everything. Yes. If one were to untangle the two things, I think I would have felt like we were all coping better if we all felt we were unified against this common external threat versus having to justify ourselves that it is a real external effect, threat to people who are deniers. But it is also, there are political agendas behind it. There's no question about it because if you look at the whole situation, it's there's also so much division between people. And that is really because mainstream media has driven one narrative and not allowed people to come around the table and actually think about what's really going on. Right. Well, what's the other narrative? No, I'm just saying, you know, like you've got the vaxxers versus the anti-vaxxers. And I don't think it's necessarily that people are anti-vaccine. It's just, you know, the fact that you have some people who have genuine health concerns by taking this and then you've got you know one side blaming the other side and this is all being driven by mainstream media and what I'm saying is is that they're not allowing the people that have actually been affected via vaccine injuries to talk about that so nobody's hearing about the side effects or very few people it's only people that are talking within their own circles that are talking about their experiences so that's really what I'm saying is you can't have one side without being able to bring people together to be able to say this is, you know, and share the experience and come to some kind of resolution. Yeah, so. well, because unfortunately, it's people who also don't really understand the difference between even a virus and a bacterial infection. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But that's yeah. why I think yeah. the actual messaging is so, you know, it's funny, like you'll be talking to one section of people in your community and then we'll be speaking to other people in other countries and the messaging they're getting is completely different yeah Yeah, well i mean we just but we have the added problem of the january 6th oh yeah so that's the problem it magnifies all the rest of that and you know with all the outlets you still have as you said the issue of hegemony to some degree with certain outlets it's true 100 percent 
But I mean, you know, it's just always does suck to live through history, right? That's the Chinese curse. Right? Yeah, hundred percent. May, may you live through interesting times, and that's that's where we are. It's a real thing, Absolutely. and it does happen in human history. And you know, you can't deny that. For instance, we have volcanoes erupting. Yeah, they're erupting. We see them. It's happening, and it's. Just unfortunate that in a certain way that you can't see the virus because then everyone would be properly a little more frightened about maintaining even proper hygiene. It was always very shocking to me that people had to be told to wash their hands. I was like, what do you mean? You haven't been washing your hands? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. I mean, that's just common sense. Yeah. And it is the case that they don't. So now what do you do? Yeah, for sure. So you've worked with some big brands and had some amazing partnerships. So can you share with us more about this and how did these opportunities come about? Well, they come about usually in sort of, at this point, more of a casual way. For instance, I've been working with Team Kitchens, which did a partnership with the Dodgers to launch their home plates, which is their delivery service of Dodger dogs and stadiums food through home delivery, things like that, because I had been part of Tap Into and the founder and I'd worked with him previously and other things. Some of the other big brands, it's hard to talk about some of them because I can't really say too much, but let's just, some of these larger cable companies, they know that I have the expertise and in interactivity and digital media and a writer background. So I've been asked to do white papers and things like that and do some other research along those lines. And then some things in the whole rush in the 90s, people tried and it didn't work. And then they came back and tried again. So that's what's interesting how these things all flow. But yeah. a lot of the big brands, it's, you know, I had the ITA. Those were all big fortune brands. I know those people, the executives go to somebody somewhere else, you know, they might leave Disney and go to Fandango or something, or, you know, our other friends start really cool and interesting companies like BuzzFeed and Jukin and Cheddar and all that next wave of media companies. And we know those guys, so it's fun. Mm -hmm. And yeah. some opportunities and things come that way. And of course, when you're programming conferences and webinars and things like that, then you're crossing paths because you'll invite them to be a speaker. And then you're up to date with them on what's going on there. LinkedIn is great. It really does work. You can work LinkedIn and do that, but it's going to be interesting to see if we don't do the in-person as much, how that business development is going to evolve. Because yeah. I do find for myself, it's much more organic and natural and easy if you come across each other when you're waiting in line at the bar. Yes. Or that you're on a conference together and, you know, then you already are sort of having an interchange and develop a relationship. And then later you're like, oh, yeah, let me ask, you know, Derek, we had that great conversation about that. It's the social interchange of us as social animals has to keep happening. Yes. And the problem is, is like texting is so utilitarian. And now I do see that younger generations text instead of email and they'll like send links and everything in a text. It's like, well, I'm not going to manipulate this document on my phone. No, <laughs> exactly. And also the thing is, I think also people are still nervous about viruses and nervous about those types of things. So I think that it doesn't always work in people's favor. Yeah. Well, and I think too, it's just that timeliness. What's the fastest thing? And, you know, you'll have everybody wanting me to be in Slack with them. I was like, well, first of all, I don't want to be having 20 conversations with all my clients and their clients. <laughs> it just is exponential. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. It has to have some filter. You can't make it worse for yourself by turning on the sluice gates and having just this pouring of data and information all the time with no discernible structure to it. And that, I think, people that are right now in their 30s, I guess, I, what generation that is, I see that they're going to be learning that because yeah. not everything is important and not everything can be shared 
in all these other ways. Some things have to be codified. Some things still have to be written up and those kind of skills. Yeah, it's, uh, but to answer your question, usually it is through traditional networking or other kinds of outreach. And then of course, increasingly in the last 10, 15 years through other kinds of filters, I will get cold outreach like, okay, I found you that you are an expert in interactive television and advanced advertising. We've got this cool thing. You want to look at it. That does happen. But typically it's more through word of mouth and just old fashioned socializing. So interactive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interacting. <laughs> I want to talk about startups as you have a real passion for startups. So what are some of the biggest and most common mistakes that startups do? And what are some of the skills and expertise that you have brought to the table regarding startups? And can you give us any examples? Well, some of the biggest mistakes are believing your own vision too much. And it's kind of counterintuitive and against what a lot of other coaches will say, because there is a watchword, especially in the U.S., of like, if you just work hard enough, if you dream big and you work hard enough, anything is possible. And that is just not true. It's not true. So you have to be rigorous in your self-reflection and your concept against what the facts are of the marketplace and have somebody, if not you, do real research and diligence on the facts of the marketplace. Yeah. What is the actual total addressable market? What is the path to get there? So some of the biggest ones I would say, it's really hard when you're under NDA on things, but Some of them have included some pretty well-known apps and social platforms, as well as straight programming on the cable side, where it was like a platform that grew out of programming, so to speak. And some things like that, that are initiatives and advanced advertising. One mistake that I myself made, as I said, is I was too early on a lot of things. So that's one thing to make sure that the timing is going to be right. And then another is that other people that have deeper pockets aren't going to beat you to market. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but it's hard to tell people because it is true that this person who has the vision and the passion is often not the same person who's going to be realistic about doing it (laughs) and getting it done. So If you do have something, make sure you have somebody that's on the operations side that's very grounded. Because I see lots of different forms of startups. There's either founders that are technical CTO types and they are going to build it and it's going to be so cool. And they not only don't understand marketing, but they are disdainful of marketing. And that's another place where often it's like seen as the purview of women still. So it's like not as important. They don't put it in their budgets and all that and which is just of course nonsense especially nowadays and then you have these other founders that have an idea that don't understand their own technology you know it's just all over the map in terms of that so it's a main second point of that i guess is to say make sure you figure out what you don't know and get people on your team who do do know it yeah 100% and and then the third point is kind of ancillary to that maybe would be Don't wait long to get legal and all that buttoned up because a lot of times they go and they get into market and things are not clean. And then when money comes in, it's a big pain in the neck to try to fix it after the fact. Yeah, absolutely. So that leads me to the final question. What are the three key pieces of advice you would give to those looking to pursue a similar career? And what legacy would you like to leave? Wow, that's a big question. (laughs) Well, I don't think anybody could have a similar career because the time when I came in, so much has changed and not relevant. Mm -hmm. So anybody who wants to be in a similar place of being in interactive TV and advanced video and all that, I would say the key advice would be make sure that you 
have a lot of sources of data input for yourself, including still reading books, like I was said earlier, mm -hmm. and make yourself available. If, if you don't like networking, figure out a way that it works for you because you have to keep scanning the horizon and have a system for yourself of filtering data so that you can read the marketplace. Yeah. When I started the magazine, we were still using boards and a razor blade. In fact, when I was in graduate school and I worked on documentary, we were using a razor blade on a film table. This is how fast everything moved. You know, that was like from one year and three years later, it already started going to digital video from 16 millimeter film. Yay. So nobody's except somebody my age is going to have had that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, the transition's gone and done. But the overall to having, you know, a sense of curiosity and being rigorous about staying open to all the trends and following the data points and putting it together and figuring out tricks for yourself so that you can do that. I think that's the main thing. If somebody wants to do this and work with startups and hop around on things. You have to like enjoy that, enjoy the uncertainty because mm -hmm. it's very uncertain and changeable. And then I guess legacy would be, to be included in those who really was pioneering in a lot of these things. And certainly as a champion institutionally, as I said, with the ITA, people are going to forget about the ITA, right? Because it was small. We were not ever big like NAB or these other ones that are lasting who now probably are struggling even a little bit given what's happened with their conference business. But I would be nice legacy wise for people saying, yeah, oh yeah, as this champion of this nascent and emerging media world that's totally transformed how we, our relationship as a consumer to media and the devices and everything else, I would like to be known to have been there and been instrumental in helping foster all this change. Amazing, Emerson. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing your insights and everything. So if people would like to connect with you, what are the best platforms to do so? I think probably just email and LinkedIn. Okay. And uh, my email is just allison at itvalliance.org, A-L-L-I-S-O-N at itvalliance.org. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully we can have you back in the future to see where you are in your journey. Sure. That sounds great. It was really good talking with you this morning.